Illinois Department of State. So um, as an active member of the Mississauga Sense Historical Society, uh, I think we can count on Lauren to give us uh, a, a, an in-depth idea of what this neighborhood was like and how it's grown. And so I'll turn it over. So this will be a shallow in depth presentation. <laughs> now, there are many of you in the room know Warren Park Estate better than I do. Do we have anybody here who lived in the estate? All right. Since we don't, and of course I could never lived in the estate, there's going to be one aspect of this we'll lose. And that's the personal life of live, living in the summer in the estate. And uh, when, you're, when you're just not a part of that group, there's a vast of human interest that's going to be missing. Uh, we'll take just a moment at first for a little bit of an overview. Uh, Warren Park Estate is really comprised of two segments. The one segment is the commercial resort that started in 1879. That's one aspect. The other aspect are the cottages. And there's a separation between the two. Uh, this started in 1878. There were nine men purchased lots 22 and 23, which ran from Lakeshore Road to the lake, and they were roughly at the base of Warren Park Road. It opened on uh, the 24th of May, 1879, which was Queen Victoria's birthday. And at that time, our lieutenant governor was the Marquis of Warren, and he served between 1878 and 1883. And the name Warren Park Estates, of course, comes from his name. Uh, the major hotel that they built, uh, the Hotel Louise, comes from the name of his wife, who was the fourth uh, daughter of Queen Victoria. Uh, it opened in the spring of 1879, and it was quite a size and quite a commercial development. I'll just rhyme off a little bit here about it. Uh, they built a wharf uh, for the steamers coming in, a hotel, which was three stories. The upper two stories were uh, uh, apartments with uh, bathrooms and kitchen and sleeping quarters. Uh, there was a dining room 100 feet by 50 feet, and off of that dining room, there was another room of the same dimension, which were for the use of the convenience of visitors. There were gazebos. One gazebo was roughly 50 feet by 30 feet, two stories, and then it had a quite a gothic third story to it. There was a dancing pavilion. There were walks, pathways, fences, Bowling alleys, billiard parlors, shooting galleries, photograph galleries, baseball diamonds, swings, merry-go-round, boat houses, tennis, bowling, and croquet courts, stables, ice houses. Uh, the hotel was fitted for uh, telegraph, later telephone, and uh, the daily newspaper came out on the train and was available to you every morning. So it was quite a complex. It was a tremendous success in the numbers of people who came. The bulk of the men who started it were associated with the Methodist Church. And in their brochure, there will be no intoxicating beverages to be served either aboard the steamers or at the park. And the result was their greatest success was church Sunday school picnics. And there are many weeks were six days of the week there would be picnics by churches. And uh, as high as 5,000 people would come out on a weekend. Now you also have to allow the steamers could not sail on the Sabbath, and uh, the gates were closed on the Sabbath, uh, except for the church service in the afternoon. There was a Sunday school service in the morning, there was a church service in the afternoon, and for that the gates were open. And then there was uh, a religious sing-song in the evening. It was a tremendous success, upwards of 5,000 people uh, on a weekend. But it was not a financial success. Uh, there's a major problem. This is Canada. 
and to build a monstrous hotel like that for the use of 60 days each year. The costs were just so great, but within the first year they were in financial difficulty uh, and unable to pay their debt. It went through three ownerships, and that commercial aspect lasted from 1879 to 1910, roughly 30 years. And then that was the end of that aspect. The cottages were the other. They started, a, a hotel company decided in the late 80s, about eight years after they started the project, to have summer cottages. And they then started to sell. In the end, roughly uh, 80 cottages. Many of most of them were quite pretentious because they were fairly well to do people who built. And uh, the lots were 50 feet in width. Most people bought at least 100 feet uh, for their cottage. Now, with this failure in 1910, the cottages were faced with a terrible dilemma. Uh, there was roughly about 80 acres. Half of it was that commercial project, half of it was the cottages. They now, if they were to purchase it, would have two major problems. One is the great cost of the debt, and then the cost of upkeep. They would now have to pay the taxes on an acreage equal to their own all over again. And they had all the upkeep of the roads and, and uh, uh, the property. So this was a, a problem that they didn't want. And yet on the other hand, uh, they were afraid with the collapse of the company that it might go to, it might just revert back to the municipality because no one would, pur would purchase it. So it was quite a dilemma for them, but they didn't want to take it on. And for the first 10 years roughly, uh, they just dragged their feet. Finally, in 1919, six of the owners of homes, and the special one here was uh, Mrs. Mary Louise Clark, they took over the problem. Uh, Mrs. Clark died in 1931. Her estate finally was never paid until 1948. Went on for 40 <coughs> years, this problem, he finally, it was before it was finally straightened up. And if it hadn't been for Mrs. Clark, uh, the whole thing years ago would have collapsed and been turned over to the community. So we've got sort of the two different aspects to look at. Oh, if anyone's interested in Warren Park Estates, there's a book, A Village Within a City, done by uh, uh, Boston Mills Press. I don't know whether copies are still available, but they will be, in, they'll be available, I would think, in the uh, uh, library. Someone may be aware of whether it is still available. Who wrote that? Three or four of the ladies from the estate. It because was done. I know one of the men, and I phoned him and told him about this, and he said his wife, Mary Liz Williams, had written a book with two other people. Right. And I, I, uh, I, they have coffee. John Lytle's wife they was one. Coffee. Susan Rowland was another who signed this. I'm not sure of the complete mm -hmm. group of names, but they this in, did this in 1980. In uh, 1974, the Mississauga South Historical Society wanted to do a program on it. And so John Lytle and Bert Hoffrichter uh, were the two who turned to. And we had a tremendous meeting over this and a series of slides. And these slides you'll see are from that, that effort that was done in 74. And then they followed along in 1980 with a vastly more complete overview. And of course, this reflects uh, the knowledge and, and the interest of the people of the estate. Well, weren't the Lytles and the Clarks related? Was John yes. Lytles uh, Clark before he married Mr. Lytle? <coughs> All right, uh, let's they're, see. They're both uh, Mrs. There. Clark, one of Mrs. Clark's daughters, married William Lytle. William <laughs> Lytle was the father of Bill and John Lytle. So they're like another generation yeah. Yeah. removed. Yeah. Now, the people who supply partner, the two major ones, of course, are, are John Ladle and Bert Hoffrichter. But here are some of the others. Mr. N. Keevil, uh, Lord Park Estates Historical Committee, is this. Uh, Chef Cassan, Mr. and Mrs. Frank Holliday, Provincial Archives Pearsall Collection, Willis Metcalf, Martin Franchetto, Metropolitan Methodist Church, Toronto, uh, First United Church Historical Committee, Port Credit, Mr. R. Hewitt, Mrs. Wynne Winniger, 
to Jeff Cox, the Toronto Telegram, Martin Franchetto, and Betty Clarkson, and those who are ones that are supplying us our presentation. Uh, I guess we can't remove, reduce the lighting. Right? <coughs> Oh, the blinds are brought down. Now, with the time allocated, we'll kind of flip along rather quickly, obviously, and, and you know, just kind of touch some of the highlights. This is a, a lithograph done in 1886 of the proposed park. Uh, obviously, uh, most of here will realize that the park really never ended up as we see here, but, but the basics are here. We've got the lake. And uh, here's the first part of the hotel. But obviously, the streets weren't laid out in the manner you see here. Side wheelers. Both the side wheelers. Uh, these are side wheelers, uh, the Picton, and here's the Empress of India. Uh, I'll show you a picture of Empress of India later. I don't have one of Picton. I have a uh, all photograph of about maybe 12, 15 of the vessels that came in here. But obviously, we spent all our time just on the vessels. Now, the 80 acres, it had changed hands 14 times, or excuse me, yeah, 14 times between uh, the 1830s and 1879. Uh, the first two people made a profit, and then on, no one did. The problem with it is that each of the lots were only about 40 acres. And this area, here you see the level land, and here you see the gullies mm -hmm. that go down through it. And so if you're farming this area here, you go on the Lakeshore Road, of course, Lakeshore Road in its original, it followed the hills exactly. So your wagon could only come up this gully with a load equivalent to what the horses could pull. So maybe a quarter of a load, half a load the most. And it was such a small area that uh, it didn't lend itself to farming. Now, here in 1886, here we see the, the dock going out here. The, the uh, dock lined up with this street. Uh, oh dear, the train's gone already. Uh, the flag off. Uh, it, these are named after poets. Uh, here we are here, from Chaucer. It lines up with the west side of Chaucer Avenue. And then the, the walk, I just put uh, a piece of metal here to indicate the dock. And you came off, and you came up to this gully here onto Burns. Or it also came across here and up, and here's the hotel here. Now, over the last hundred years, uh, seven acres have gone into the lake. And when you come back this, go to this next picture, this whole esplanade, Bowstead Terrace it was called, but this esplanade across the front, and it's, the shoreline now is back into these first lots now. And there's the seven acres have gone. Periods of high water and easterly gales, of course, take the lakefront land away. And at this point, you can see here the cottage that had been sold and the streets uh, running approximately north and south. They're really been closer to east and west, but because the shoreline from Toronto to Hamilton swings down. Uh, they are named for poets. And then the original directors of the company are the horizontal streets here, such as Bowstead, Hoodier Crest, and that, the one of the vertical ones. And here's an early picture of the hotel. It went through three major rebuildings. But this is its appearance at first. And here is its final appearance. This is automatic sharpening. I usually bring my wife to keep doing it, but this dash thing is getting a little slow now. And you see what a grandiose thing it was at the last. Wow. Uh, this is the last rebuilding in 19... Uh, 10, and you see the huge portico here, the large wings on it, there's a large wing on either side, and it's just quite a grandiose building. So the porch kept the sun off. The, 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 port, the front porch keeps the sun off the, oh, the, yeah. uh, up, the, the building. Was coming around. So Although I suppose the trees did a fair job of that too, because they're up so high. But uh, here's the wing over on the east end. Now, you're going to have to get to the estate. In the early days, most people came by boat. And from Toronto, it was uh, 
25 cents for a return trip for adults, 15 cents for children. This is the Quinty. This picture can, no be later, can be no later than the summer of 1889. She burned in the fall, uh, a very sad loss. Her captain was burned so badly, his face, uh, he never smiled again. He couldn't. The scar tissue was so great. Uh, his own mother and his brother were lost when she burned in the fall of 89. Now, uh, here's the, the dock. The dock was composed of, the original dock, of seven cribs. And here's the end of a crib here. And then the timbers run from one crib to another. The outer crib was much larger than that uh, at the outer end, of course, to uh, carry this. Here you see a windmill. Uh, with the trees up in the park, you couldn't put a windmill up there to pump the water up to the water tank of the hotel. So I had, they had this windmill out on the end of the pier. It was gone before the turn of the century from heavy gales. Uh, it also had a, an oil lamp on it here for a range light for the, the steamer. Later on, they added another section of this carrying off to the east on an angle. Uh, here's the Empress of the India that we uh, you see in that earlier picture. These are the early side wheelers with, with the big fixed wheels and not the feathering wheels. When you get into a feathering, these fixed wheels just, the paddles came around like that. Whereas a, a feathering wheel, it was much smaller. There was a second concentric circle, and it turned the paddle so that as it came down into the water, it was a more efficient pull this way. It didn't tip, and so they didn't have to be so big. So later pictures of these vessels, you'll all see this much lower. Uh, the White Star was called the Sunday School Boat. Uh, she brought in so many of the uh, Sunday School picnics to the park. And the Sunday School picnics. This is uh, Fort Credit Methodist Church. Now, the churches would range from uh, Toronto to Hamilton. Now, the larger centers like Oakdale and Hamilton and Toronto, the numbers would be great. The church attendance at that time. For instance, I have the Baptist Methodist Sunday School picnics of eight, picnic of 1898 at Brawny. The Baptist and the Methodist joined together. At that picnic, Brawny had a population of about 450 people at the time. There were 107, 183 in that photograph. Uh, but this is uh, Fort Pettit. Here's Reverend Dudgeon. Uh, here's old uh, Captain uh, Abe Block of the shipyard. Here's Captain uh, Russell Walker, uh, Stone Hooker captain, and he finally had a store right beside Clark Hall, which of course relates to the Clark. Uh, here's uh, Park Credit Citizens Band, uh, and of course different organizations, you know, different societies and organizations would have picnics there. Uh, here's the uh, Metropolitan Methodist Church from Toronto. Now here's the judges. One judge here, we've got a judge over here, or a starter. Okay. I presume that this may be a candle ring. I think maybe the girls are holding illuminated candles. The faster you go, you're liable to win the race, but the faster you go, the more chance the candle will blow up. But and that, maybe you can correct me, but I think that's what it is. And here they are. Now, I'm not sure whether this is basketball or not, because everybody seems to have their own ball. <laughs> Well, it does reduce competition. But, uh, maybe somebody explain why everybody has a ball. <laughs> now, you can also come by train. Uh, the Great Western Line went through from uh, Toronto to Hamilton in 1855. And you could come out by train, and of course it was just a block walk down to the hotel, and to the estate. Uh, here in 1909, uh, is the entrance in, and here at this time you'll see Lake, Lake, oh, Lake Shore Country Club. And that was the last name, and it was at this period for about one year that they had a liquor license. And it didn't last the year, it uh, did not meet with very much satisfaction. <coughs> and some of the homes, they started in the late 80s. Uh, to build the homes, and in the end, 80, approximately 80 homes were built on the 40 acres. Uh, most of the owners were well-to-do, and uh, many of the cottages were designed by architects. And you can see the, the style of the day, so to speak. 
And we get very well as soon as most of these will be shuttered green and green. Now at Easter, usually on the 24th of May, they would come out and uh, visit the cottage for the day. And then they usually would return the 1st of July. And uh, a cottage wagon would start out early in the morning with all their needs for the summer. And uh, they in turn would make, come by boat or by train uh, so that both arrived at roughly the same time. And of course, around the lawn, this is uh, Mr. and Mrs. Clark's uh, flower bed and uh, lawn, back lawn. And here you see the Dundas shale that comes from the lake. It was used for the building of early Toronto and Hamilton and all, the, all our centers along here. The churches of the basement, all of our early churches, the uh, Carmen Church and uh, the old original First United, now they would all be the Dundas shale basement. Until after the turn of the century. Uh, the gazebos and that, the summer house, that, I don't have a picture of that huge one, uh, but it's in, there's one in this book, and it's a very grandiose looking one, but this is along that Bowstead Terrace. And of course, young people get together. Uh, and again, uh, uh, I guess for many young people, this is where they met their wives or husbands. And uh, there's another small one here, and this is the road that carried around to, uh, went down the gully and joined up with Whittier Crescent. And the different tradesmen and that sort of thing came in the east gate, and the people of the estates came in the west gate. And here you see, coming down Whittier Crescent and turning here is a man coming in to do business. Now, uh, this could be uh, Clarkson fruit farmers, you know, bringing fruit and vegetables, that sort of thing, to the people in the estate. Uh, it could be Bob Lackey. He was uh, a grocer in the credit. Uh, Bert Lackey, West Side Dairy, was one of his sons. Sorry, this thing isn't. Looks like your shelves is going to sleep. Uh, now, uh, Dan Dury from uh, Clarkson, uh, with Butcher, his wagon was almost identical appearance to this, and he would come in. Uh, you would even get uh, Eaton's. This is Eaton's 1898 catalog, and you could buy a nice quality violin for $1. Uh, the next one to drive down here is below this is $5. Now that's, oh, wow. That was the layout of the 98 catalog. It was laid out to like a telephone book. We've got a complete series of this. Now, uh, after 1906, you could come out and buy a radio car. They finished the radio car from uh, Long Branch out to Port Credit. And here you see the girls getting off. Uh, this was just, uh, oh, about uh, three, two or three hundred feet to the east of the Port Credit post office. It used to be in front of Pete the Greek's restaurant with the rivers later on. Right across the street, this is where Mr. Uh, Clark, Clark Real Estate, was later on. Uh, they took the third store, that's uh, uh, Hamilton's elevator, grain elevator. They took the top story off in 1919 and then he made it his uh, uh, real estate office. This used to come up by radio man. Or, as we get after the turn of the century, you would come by car. Now, this <laughs> is just west of Port Credit, between Port Credit Line and State, or Target State. It's, be, it's probably the first or second dip. But that was the condition of the highway until 1960. And this was the first highway to be paved in the province of Ontario with concrete outside of a built up center. We started in Hamilton in the fall of 14 and cut down to uh, Ronsonville in the fall of 17. Uh, yeah, that's Lakeshore Highway. That's the main highway from Toronto to Hamilton. Uh, at that time, there wasn't any Queen Elizabeth. Uh, the only next road would be Dundas Highway, but that's the appearance of the highway before it was paved. And of course, the early cars gave a lot of trouble. Uh, the Clark car has this white band around it, and here's Mr. Clark here. And of course, uh, a flap is just a normal thing uh, on almost any trip in the early days of any 
just as a fellow, you had to count on one or two flats. And some of the activities for the folks in the estate. Uh, here's the lawn bowling. This is in 1902. And here we see another picture in 1906 of lawn bowling. And uh, the people in the states involved themselves with the community very much. Clarkson was very fortunate in a way in that with these summer people coming out, uh, they added another dimension to the community. And some of them were not involved with the global community, and others were very involved, such as music and uh, uh, the plays that used to go on, that sort of thing. And they, they were a very important part of the uh, community. Uh, Bronte felt the same thing. And in their case, uh, uh, the Waltons from Hamilton uh, built a brand new church in 1913. And tennis. And of course, uh, thank goodness the photographer was taking pictures for us. Again, these are the girls from the Metropolitan Methodist Church in Toronto. And here, remember I mentioned about the water tank? Uh, this is it. Uh, but in 1916, it suddenly collapsed across the uh, bowling green. So that was the end of it. it when there wasn't wind for the windmill, there was also steam power down at the bottom. We'll see it later. Now, some of the activities down at the beach. Now, as I say, most of these people are well to do. I presume that this is mother, and this is the little one, and I imagine this is either the maid or the nanny. Is it her? Here. Yeah. She might be a registered nurse. I'm not sure. Look like an old guy. She could be. And, oh, remember I mentioned about the boiler, the, the, when they didn't have enough wind pumping the water up. Here's the, the steam boiler here. That's an auxiliary boiler. It was identical to the ones they put on the lake schooners in, in the 1880s. It reduced the crew need. This handled the anchor and uh, the uh, hazards for lifting sail. And the steam engine itself is in here. I have another picture of this, and uh, storms have stove this, stove this in, and you can see the engine inside. And this is the boathouse here. And the, the dock was just to the uh, east of this location. There's the boathouse there. There's one of the cribs driven ashore. And imagine with the east Gales, gales has been driven to the westward because the dock lined up between this uh, uh, picnic shelter and here the corner of the boathouse. And again, proper swimming rig of the day. Yeah, very, very fetching. And, uh, okay. and teach her how to do it, girl. <laughs> I suspect that this is uh, that last crib that uh, a plank is laid up. Uh, it lasted until uh, July of 1903. And in July of 1903, an intersection collapsed into shallow water. The people dropped down into the water, but uh, it was shallow enough they were able to walk ashore. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was not rebuilt after that. Lauren, that looks like a sand beach there. Yeah, there's a bit of say, uh, in the lake, there's a fair amount of sand along here. I'll, there'll be something on that in just a minute. Uh, there's a little bit of sand here, but most of the sand along here is a rather large green. But there's a little bit of uh, sand you'll see here, but not a tremendous amount. Some spots had a bit, some didn't. Uh, Mr. Hewitt's uh, sailboat. This is probably an Ackroyd 14. Uh, Griffiths uh, Clark, the son of the Clark. Uh, there was a son and a daughter they lost early in life, and then the one girl uh, that married the label uh, survived. Uh, this is Griffiths uh, motor launch to Leopard. This is taken all uh, after the building of the seawall in Toronto. Built the exhibition ground. And of course, off the estate, uh, the Pearsalls. Uh, they and this is from their photo album. And here's one of the stone hooking schooners working off here. Uh, this is the Maud S. Maud S. was named after the fastest horse for the wooden sultan. And here's our attending scout. He had a long handle rake, 16 to 18, 20 feet long, two times at right angles. And you slide it underneath the Dundas shale. You fist 
lifted in a fast hand over hand action, and then with the momentum, when it breaks the surface of the water, you swing it onto the deck of the scow. And then you pull the scow over to the attending schooner, toss the stone aboard. And these stone schooners would carry an average of about 30 to 70 tons of stone. Now, the stone was piled on a wharf in towns, and mostly in Toronto, because that was the major one. You made a wall, you laid a wall 12 feet long, 6 feet wide, and 3 feet high in a rectangle, then you threw loose stone in the middle. That weighed approximately 10 tons, it was 260 cubic feet, and that was called a tice of stone, spelled T-O-I-S-E, but, you know, like Toronto and Toronto, uh, Charlotte and Shalot. Uh, that weighed uh, 10 tons. If you were a builder, you came down and bought one, two, three of these for whatever the construction project. And this applied all the early building stones for these communities until uh, after the turn of the century. For about 60 years, there would be at least 20 to 40 of these schooners laying in Port Fed in three rows, the complete width of the harbor, from Front Street over to State Bank Road, because uh, the vessels would, could not operate on the Sabbath. Uh, it's the same with those side rivers. You, you couldn't enter a canal on the Sabbath in those days. And the, here you see the, the dock disappearing, and uh, the canoe is here. Now, by the time any of us in this room, I think, were youngsters, all that was left of these would be sections underneath. You could swim out and stand on a section, and it might be maybe three or four feet under, two to four feet under water in the 1930s. When you mention about sand bottom, here's Fish Tug Morocco. In 1930, 1937, Morocco was came in for the North Park Estates, and she started at what we call a rail lernet. She would start in just about six or seven feet of water, and she would run in shore to about four or four and a half feet of water. So she was just almost grounded. And then she would swing and float but back and forth, just like a rail fence with her net. Then when you get a little bit of wind, a little bit of sea, it starts to lift the sand off the bottom, and it scours the moss out of your net. And she was doing that when she slid across one of those. She slid across until the crib was just about under the after doors here, and her bow dropped down, and the stern was lifted up, and she lost her fight with her propeller. And one of the boys had to go ashore and teach my couple of friends to get another fish tug to slide it off that. Uh, these are the ice conditions of those days in uh, Lake Ontario. Uh, tremendous warming over water. Our inshore ice is totally, our ice banks have now totally disappeared. Here's St. Lawrence Bank. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Clark. This is taken as an Atlantic City. And of course, Mr. Clark unfortunately lost his life in the uh, First World War on the Lusitania. He was the owner of the Clark Leather Company and he was going over overseas. Mrs. Clark built Clark Hall Port Credit as a memorial to him. My mother was standing beside her and Reverend Dudgeon. When she turned to Reverend Dudgeon as they were completing the building, he said, What about a sustaining fund for the bill. This is 1920. Things weren't going too badly. And he said, Mrs. Clark, he said, if we can't sustain the building that you supplied us, he said, we're not worthy of the building. And so no sustaining fund was put up there and bailed out. Oh dear. <laughs> it couldn't be planned to find the church building. The trustees were members of the Methodist Church, or had to be, <clears throat> but it was for the use of the community. And so the taxation caused them to lose it. In. Uh, this is the submarine that sank the Lusitania. Uh, that was in uh, May of 1915. This is late in the fall of 1916. And the submarine grounded out on the coast of Belgium. The tide was going out, and they were unable to get her back into deep water before she was stranded. So they set charges. You can see how they've blown up here. Here's sections here <coughs> after, after the Coning Tower, where they've blown up. Now, the 1930s. This is this is the first issue of the Port Credit Weekly, June 1938, and this is the value of a home in Lawrence Park Estates. You can see 19 what? 1938. 1938. In 1934, if my mother offered you that deed and said, "Young lady, you can have the orchard." This would represent the acre and a quarter on the bank of the river at Port Credit, where the Port Credit Arena is now. 
Because he said, young lady, you give me a dollar and you can have the orchard. It would have been yours. But you'd have been the biggest fool on the face of the earth to pay the dollar for it. How are you going to keep the thing up if it's value? Just give it away. Uh, and uh, 19, we were married in 1950. In 1949, I looked at a lot on Whittier Crest, about halfway down, and it faced out an angle into the gully, looked beautifully out over the lake. The man had built his basement, had put the floor on, he had all the heating, he had all this plumbing, and he wanted to sell that, but he wanted $3,800. I had $5,000. I intended to build a house of my own for $5,000. So I paid $3,800 for that. The rest of it, I wouldn't have enough money to finish building the house. So I turned it down for $3,800. But he, he was living in that basement. He, you said he had heating? I can't remember the he chap's floor, name. He had floor there, and he had heating in it. Yeah, he had the heating he, downstairs. He was really in the thing. All right. you, you don't put a furnace in a building if you haven't yeah. finished it. Oh, sure. But about, uh, well, all of you here will be familiar with it. A quarter of us, uh, when we come back from the service, you know, you were getting a dollar a day. Yeah. And, of course, after the depression, that, I'd say a quarter of us, we brought a home plan where you came in a side door, went four or five steps up the kitchen, and five or six steps down the basement. You put the door in there and sloped it down. You tar papered it over, and you moved in the basement. You lived there for a couple of years, and then you started to build the upstairs. So you weren't doing it with a... Yeah, so that, that, you know, what you're mentioning about him, that was standard procedure. He had just tar papered over it, and I didn't mention about him living in the basement. But, well, that's, that's the... Oh, yeah, that was the standard procedure. We moved into our house uh, uh, before the windows were yeah, yeah. A lot of said that, you know, you built the basement, tar papered over, lived in there, and then you started to build the upstairs. That's the hot air out there. You made 50 bucks for the fellow that excavated yeah. your basement for you. Yeah. Yeah. And here is uh, Bear's gravestone in Mount Pleasant Cemetery, Albert Russell Clark and Mary Louise Clark. And here near the last is uh, Bert Amos. Uh, this is 1947. Uh, they still have the oil lamps. They're all they were was just a, a standard wick kerosene lamp. And then there was a reflector in here. And then there's the, the vent at the top of it. And uh, that lasts until 1952. And here is uh, Mr. Frank Halliday. Some of you will remember him. He has such a beautiful singing voice. Have we, have we got? Oh, oh, all right. Yes, his painting. I thought maybe we had a holiday here. Uh, yes. He uh, remember the Great Coach Bus line, the shield, and at the top of it there was a little tire, circular tire and Great Coach line, and then there was a wing at either side of it. Uh, he was the one that painted that. And a wonderful voice. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, now with that line will be Tom and John's father. Yeah, this is Mr. William Lytle, their father, and his wife was the daughter of Mrs. Clark. And uh, the when it failed in 1910, uh, it went for almost 10 years that nothing was done, and finally in 1919, the disturbance that this could either reduce the whole thing could go back to the community, or, uh, you know, it was in, in bankruptcy. Go back to the Mrs. community. Mrs. Clark taxes. and five, pardon? And go back to the community because the arrears of taxes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mrs. Clark and five others decided to accept that indebtedness. And she, through, those, through the 20s, we had some bad years. And she kept buying up property and buying up lots to try and keep the thing afloat. If it hadn't been for her, this thing would have definitely collapsed. And she died in 1931, and this is 1948, before her son-in-law is finally winding it up with uh, the folks from making a final settlement with the uh, folks in the estate. And this is just before any value really came into the property. And of course, the whole area has changed now into permanent residence. And of course, the, the value is Pay for one house, we can buy half of our credit for. <laughs> What's the building in the background there? Uh, that's uh, one of the large, larger summer homes. I can't identify which one it is. Some of you here may know, but it's, it's in the estates, and that's one of the larger. 
coming in and then it rises up. The first oh, 250 feet or so was like this terrace yeah. and then it was the first thing behind the terrace. Yeah. If you went in uh, the main gate, go straight to the, to the lake, uh, I would say about a third of where the hotel was is now gone in the lake because mm -hmm. it's taken the front of the, the lots on either side. Like it was in line with the lots that are on either side. Mm -hmm. It was straight in from the from the main gate. And the main gate would be approximately where today, right? It was right where the main gate is. Well, I call it the main gate. Yeah. You know where you enter at the foot of Warren Park Road. Oh, oh. And then there's the that's other little one, you know, over at Whittier. At Whittier. Yeah. 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 Well, some of the cottages are still there, aren't they? I mean, oh, they are. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them, you know, have, <laughs> some of you could identify them from the photograph. Mm -hmm. And of course, others have been so vastly changed. Of course, some have been taken down, taken fire from that. But uh, I think each one, we can remember our childhood and growing up and the things we were associated with the summer, which was our pleasure. Now, maybe some of you had a, a summer cottage and you relate very much to that. You can imagine how these people related uh, to that, the good times, but there's also the bad times. First World War, Second World War, uh, father being taken with cancer, something like that, you know. <laughs> but then you treasure those very good early years yeah. you had. Yeah. And just imagine all, you know, the sing songs they'd have, and at a different time, a couple of times they've had a, a newspaper for a period of time in the estate. And uh, it's been a rather intriguing existence to a degree, but still a lot of problems. On your street now, as they said, look, we're going to destroy every second home, and you can have that for farmland, but we're going to give you that, and we're going to give you that, and we're going to give you the street, but you've got to pay the taxes on that land. You've got to pay the taxes on the street for the street. Now, you imagine what they were faced with. I mean, it's a lumpy area and everything, but, uh, of course, early days, taxes weren't the, you know. They maintained the roads and everything themselves. Oh, yes, yeah. I haven't gone into that too much, but no, no, for no. most of it, and, and they still do most of it, a few more more and more facilities, you know, like creeks and fire and that are being right. provided now, but they still provide a large percentage of their own, and it's still, that property is considered to be owned by all. Like it's always a sign saying private property, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no access to nature or something like the, that. On the building, uh, I, I, I have to bring this as much as I can do to you, and I'm <laughs> I'm quite surprised by the car called Monster Monster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's yes, I imagine that's, that's uh, there's probably a feeling about that. Um, I was surprised mm -hmm. that they didn't have some kind of bylaw because I know it was kind of. Well, I'm not sure whether you know they. I suppose the building will come under Mississauga bylaws. But they used to have the original their first bylaw of building a cottage is they can't build it if you don't spend four hundred dollars. That's the first major hurdle. And boy. A lot of cottages were built with a lot less than $400. But uh, uh, there's many sort of in and out of that that we wouldn't be, I think most of it wouldn't be familiar with. Well, the, the person I know that lives there, I mentioned this today, and he said, Tom, you'd be interested in his life with it. And he said they had just, I said, I haven't been down there for years, and I said, I guess a lot of the old homes are gone. He said, yes, they just tore one down next to us that was built in 1905. Right. So there was, there one went just uh, two or three years ago to, three or four years ago to fire. And wasn't there a lady who lost her life, I think? Yeah. And that was one that had to come down there. How many old ones are left? Is what you see. Yeah, I think about two or five. Because uh, uh, there's, a, there's approximately 80. How um, many? I don't know what, was it maybe 30? Uh, I, I just there's can't there. tell. There are a modest, so a few. modest yeah. number. <laughs> but there's a lot of new, you know, the public yeah. works. Yeah. Now the monster home. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank Lauren on behalf of all of us. Yeah.